Ever since the human race began domesticating dogs, breeding sheep for meat, and otherwise interfering with the process of natural selection to further our own ends, we have been participating in a rudimentary form of genetic modification. Through the process of selective breeding, humans have been altering various species of plants and animals for thousands of years. As a result of this, instead of just having wolves, we now have innumerable different types of dogs, from the incredibly useful such as German Shepherds, Labradors, and many different types of Retrievers, through to the absolutely pointless like miniature toy poodles, La Hassa, Absos, and Spaniels. As previously stated, it isn't just animals. Many foods that people take for granted today, such as corn, bananas, and cucumbers, only exist in their current form as a direct result of human genetic intervention. But what about more invasive interference? You don't have to look very hard to find examples of specialist genetic modification in science fiction, from books such as Aldous Huxley's Brave New World through to movies like Jurassic Park and Gattaca, examples of why it might be better not mess around with this sort of thing are absolutely everywhere. But how is this represented in the real world? How far has science come with regards to, say, genetically modifying people to make them super strong or creating awesome animal-human hybrids? Well, let's find out, shall we? It's why you're here. The first example of a genetically modified organism, GMO, came about as early as 1973. Biochemists Herbert Boyer and Stanley Cohen successfully transplanted some DNA from one bacterium into another, permanently altering its genetic structure. As a direct result of this impressive achievement, scientists were able to use a similar process in order to create a bacteria capable of producing human insulin. In 1982, this bacteria would become the first GMO approved for use by the FDA, and since then, it has saved countless lives. It's not just the field of medicine that has benefited from GMOs. In 1987, research began on the cow gene flavor saver tomato. These tomatoes had their DNA sequence artificially altered in order to reduce the production of a particular protein, which, in turn, meant that they would stay firmer for longer, which would greatly increase their shelf life. Five years later, these tomatoes would be approved for sale to members of the public, and after the approval of BT corn, a modified strain of corn that produces its own pesticides in 1995, the agricultural industry has not looked back. Although life-saving bacteria and self-protecting crops are all very impressive, what advancements, both actual and predicted, could be made by altering the DNA of people or animals? For the United States, at least, the presence of GMOs in the local food chain isn't really new. 90% of the corn, soybeans, and sugar beets on the market have undergone some form of DNA altering, be it to improve shelf life, pest resistance, or even just flavor. This is something most people who take a little bit of interest in where their food comes from have been aware of for some time. However, what a lot of people don't know is that a lot of the fish that is consumed in the United States has also undergone DNA modification. Take salmon, for example. Some of the farmed salmon produced within the US has undergone DNA modification so that as the fish ages, it does not stop producing growth hormone. This particular modification allows the fish to be sold as a full-size salmon after 18 months rather than the traditional three years. But let's take this one step further. What if you could have a delicious burger, a tasty sausage, or a juicy steak without ever having to kill an animal at all? No, I'm not talking about those so-called meat substitutes that don't really taste very much like meat. I'm talking about real meat. The only difference being that this beef, pork, chicken, lamb was not grown as part of an animal, but in a lab using DNA modification techniques. Is it likely that this will ever be possible? Well, yes. It already is, actually. According to Professor Mark Post of Maastricht University, who cultured the world's first burger in 2013, the process is, relatively speaking, fairly straightforward. So, to quote, cells are acquired from an animal by a harmless biopsy, then placed in a warm, sterile vessel with a solution called growth medium containing nutrients including salts, proteins, and carbohydrates. Every 24 hours or so, the cells will have doubled. At the moment, this product sounds a little bit unappetizing. Even the CEO of Good Meat, a company working on the future development 
owners of this kind of product, Josh Tetrick, says the following. Cellular farming doesn't grow cuts of meat with bone and with skin or fat marbled through it like a succulent ribeye steak. Muscle cells require different conditions and nutrients to fat cells, so they must be made separately. When the pure meat or fat is harvested, it is a formless paste of cells. This is why the first cultivated meat products served up have been chicken nuggets or burgers. And look, as delicious as formless paste sounds, it would appear that we're a fairly long way from being able to go into a restaurant and order a perfect cow-free ribeye steak and now I know what I want for dinner. Gene editing is not only being used to achieve guilt-free deliciousness, it actually has many practical applications within the medical world. All the research in this field is currently limited to animal testing and a few very specific highly controlled clinical studies. The hope is that it could eventually be used to treat genetic disorders such as cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, and sickle cell disease. So, how's it work? The most recent technique in gene editing is known as CRISPR-Cas9, which is short for Clustered Regularly Interspersed Short Palindromic Repeats and CRISPR-Associated Protein 9. According to MedicinePlus.gov, CRISPR-Cas9 was adapted from a naturally occurring genome editing system that the bacteria use as an immune defense. When infected with viruses, bacteria capture small pieces of the virus's DNA and insert them into their own DNA in a particular pattern in order to create segments known as CRISPR arrays. The CRISPR arrays allow the bacteria to remember the viruses or closely related ones. If the viruses attack again, the bacteria produce RNA segments from the CRISPR arrays that recognize and attach to specific regions of the virus's DNA. The bacteria then use Cas9 or a similar enzyme to cut the DNA apart, which disables the virus. Researchers adapted this immune defense system to edit DNA. They create a small piece of RNA with a short guide sequence that attaches, binds to a specific target sequence in a cell's DNA, much like the RNA segments bacteria produce from the CRISPR array. This guide RNA also attaches to the Cas9 enzyme. When introduced into cells, the guide RNA recognizes the intended DNA sequence and the Cas9 enzyme cuts the DNA at the targeted location, mirroring the process in bacteria. Once the DNA is cut, our researchers use the cell's own DNA repair mechanism mechanism to add or delete pieces of genetic material or to make changes to the DNA by replacing an existing segment with a customized DNA sequence. What this means in practice is that scientists can alter genetic code in much the same way as one might edit a text document using the find and replace facility. Specific sections of defective code can be located, removed, and replaced either with the correct sequence or a different sequence entirely. This means that the genetic defect that causes, say, cystic fibrosis could technically be removed from the very structure of the DNA contained within the sufferer. This advanced level of DNA editing not only offers a potential cure for many yet incurable diseases, it also means that it could technically be possible to alter the sections of code that decide how tall we are and the density of bone and muscle fibers. This means that it would be technically possible to create super tall and exceptionally strong humans. Alongside curing diseases, gene editing has the potential to prevent certain conditions from developing in the first place. If the DNA of sperm and egg cells is altered before conception, the risk of parents passing on hereditary conditions such as sickle cell disease could be eliminated entirely. Although this is undoubtedly a positive medical advancement, the very same technology runs the risk of being used for less noble purposes. The so-called designer baby concept is one that has been around now for a few years. Advances in gene-altering technology could make this disturbing concept a reality. The idea behind the concept is fairly straightforward. Two parents who wish to have a child could if the DNA of sperm and egg cells were altered before conception, decide everything about that child. And we really mean everything. It's hair color, eye color, skin color, just to name a few. Whilst at first glance this might not appear to be a huge problem, it actually has the potential to cause catastrophic ramifications as far as the future diversity of the human race goes. One of the main reasons that the human race is still in pretty good shape genetically is that our gene pool is very diverse. Any attempt to reduce that level of diversity is unlikely to have many positive connotations for our future. Another concern that is often cited with regards to future development of this technology is the cost. It is highly likely that should this technology become 
widely used and widely available, it will be really expensive. In countries such as the United States, who still do not have free healthcare for all, whether or not people are able to benefit will come down to such factors as how much money they have or how much their health insurance provider is prepared to pay for such treatments. This is inevitably going to create an even wider health divide between the rich and the poor. And worse than that, if gene editing is allowed to progress to the designer baby stage that we previously mentioned, and let's be honest, as humans we don't exactly have a fantastic track record for abstaining from the pursuit of technological advancement to protect the future, there is a very real risk of creating a two-tiered society, the top tier being made up of genetically perfect elites and the bottom from those not fortunate enough to be able to afford the upgrades. So. To answer the question we asked at the beginning of this video, how close is science to being able to create superhumans, the answer is, theoretically at least, we're already there. However, as with many such things, the real question is not how quickly we should be doing this, but whether we should be doing it at all. Thanks for watching.